my next guest. You know, I was, I was thinking after I watched the, uh, the Hunger Games that wouldn't it be awesome if there was actually a real Katniss Everdeen because, I, I, you know, I don't know which is going to happen first, the real revolution or the revolution, because, you know, there's two, there's two movies for the last one. And I, I was trying to think the other day, I was actually going to write a blog for Mind Body Green called Who is the Real Katniss Everdeen and Would She Please Stand Up? And I, I think it's Dr. Kelly Brogan. So <laughs> she's going to come here and uh, give us a little chat. That's your music intro. <laughs> I want a girl with a mind like a diamond. I want a girl who knows what I wanted to talk tonight about. Oh, wait, you get a mic. Everyone gets a mic. Something to do with my hands. So, I wanted to talk tonight about what functional medicine can do to your brains as clinicians and what it can do for the brains of your patients. But I wanted to start by asking, how many people here love their job? Yes. So that's what I anticipated seeing, and I can certainly echo that sentiment. I departed from conventional medicine very abruptly after my fellowship, and I often reflect on how I used to think. And I'm sure that there are many of you who have been you know, in the conventional fold for years, if not decades. And I wonder if you reflect on the differences between the way that you think now and the way that you used to think. And I'm reminded of a term from my medical school neurology clerkship, which is anosognosia. And it means lack of insight into a clinical deficit. And I think it's very relevant to the way that our allopathic colleagues are practicing because I think it's, you know, they're they're doing their best. They're struggling in a broken system. And I think it's very hard for them to acknowledge that they're applying acute care medicine to the management of chronic disease for this endless whack-a-mole game of symptom suppression that drives further pathology. I think it's really hard for them to, to appreciate the problem with the fact that at the bottom of every prescription pill bottle for their patients is just another prescription pill bottle and that leads to 20% of Americans taking five or more prescriptions for a lifetime. And I think it's particularly hard for them to acknowledge the gravity of enmeshment, corruption, and multi-layer conflict of interest between the practice of medicine, medical science, and a $1.3 trillion pharmaceutical industry. And I don't think it's their fault, because I don't think that they have the framework to ask why their patients are so sick. And I don't think they can see beyond a pill cure. But I think that's what functional medicine offers. I think it offers this framework. And I think it offers a lens through which to look at the enormity of the crisis that we're in. Our food, our air, our water, our technology, and our health. But I think that it can feel really nihilistic, like the sky is falling. And I'm sure that there are so many potential bright functional medicine practitioners who fall by the side of the road because this is so fear-inducing, reckoning with this reality. And I can relate still. I was at an airport a couple of weeks ago, delayed, and I picked the only thing off of the menu that I could potentially stomach, and it was a baked chicken with a side of broccoli. And all I could think about while I was eating it was the GMO, antibiotic-stuffed chicken who lived in a tortured life in a coop so that I could, you know, so that I could have lunch, and the pesticide-saturated shell of a plant that I was eating. And that certainly doesn't make for a very rest and digest experience. And then I, you know, I think about taking my five-year-old to a birthday party and watching all of the kids eat pizza and cake and all I can envision is the interleukin-6 that's like teeming through their veins as they're consuming these foods. And that doesn't make it very easy for me to commune with the other moms. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think that the mandate is to acknowledge that we are poisoning our genome, that we are devolving ourselves as a species before our eyes. But then to recognize that we can potentially leverage our relationship with the natural world for change. And that's where there's this spark ignited and a hunger for a new type of knowledge can build. 
and it can really become a passion partner and a lifestyle. I mean, in the end, functional medicine and its practice is a lifestyle, and it can be so consuming to almost a pathological extent. I was reading a conference brochure the other day, and my daughter, who's unfortunately very accustomed to seeing me reading a lot of my life, um, you know, on the cover was this mitochondria, right? So it's like a brown sh bean-shaped thing. And she came up to me and she said, Mama, I'm so happy to see you reading a book about hot dogs for a change. <laughs> <laughs> and it was sort of emblematic to me of sometimes how apart, you know, you can feel in this pursuit, this pursuit of such a new, such a new kind of knowledge. But I think that in the end, it's, it's, about, it's about exercising the right to, a new, to accessing a new kind of information and bringing different, a different kind of curiosity and a kind of humbled awe, shedding the hubris and thinking about how we can use the precautionary principle in our real lives. And so when I think about how do I use this in my practice, I, I often refer to an analogy that to me makes a lot of sense. Because when I think about meeting a new patient, I envision them like this wilting, withering plant that's been on a shelf in a dark, you know, recirculated air room under a fluorescent light. And they're coming to me and they have all of these, you know, paper clips and sticks and pieces of tape holding all their limbs up. And my task is just to bring the basics back to them, right? So sunlight, clean air, water, and to rehabilitate that soil so that I can help them take that scaffolding off and to recognize their native vitality. And I can bring them these fascinating concepts like xenohormesis and coevolution with the microbial world. And I can help them to recognize that they're not just a diseased organ walking around, that in fact their organ is in a system of systems that is in a human that has this incredible interconnectedness with an ecology of plants, animals, microbes, and the energetic forces that connect us all. Because we're really not androids with chemical levers and prescription deficiencies. And I think that brings me to, so what can medicine, functional medicine, do for the brains of your patients? And so I think about, as a psychiatrist, I think about human behavior and this huge umbrella that is encompassed by mental health, right? So everything from schizophrenia to day-to-day -day malaise and forgetfulness and, and brain fog. And I think that it's particularly vulnerable to the reductionist one disease, one pill model. And I think that the fact is we really don't know very much about what causes states of distress and mood disturbance. But we do know that misregulated inflammation and oxidative stress are the underpinnings of every chronic disease, whether it's autoimmunity or cancer or metabolic syndrome. And we know that the comorbidity between psychiatric syndromes and these chronic diseases is too great to ignore. So we have an opportunity, I think, to spare generations of people from mind-body toxins that are peddled as treatments. And in my opinion, there is no room for integrative medicine here because I think we need to open our eyes and acknowledge the lies that we have been told by industry. And we have to think about how we can use evidence to teach us about a more intuitive, intelligent medicine, to teach us how to send the body and the mind a signal of safety in such a dangerous world. So, so how do we do that, right? So I think it makes the most sense to me to start where natural medicine doctors have been starting for centuries, which is the gut, right? And to use data to help us understand a bi-directional relationship between the gut and the brain, that cytokines are these messengers that travel and communicate through the vagus nerve and the microglia, that they interfere with uh, feedback loops in hormones and trafficking of neurotransmitters, so that we're really decimating these false boundaries between immunology, neurochemistry, and, and, uh, and endocrinology. And we can look at the data that tells us that, that fecal transplants and rodents change behavior, that lipopolysaccharides of bacteria induces depression, and that probiotics in humans in randomized trials mitigates anxiety. 
And so we can start to think about things like fermented sauerkraut as preventive medicine. But I think we also have to put on our activist hats and we have to help our patients understand how to interact with the world through medical consumerism. We have to teach them about physiologic birth and breastfeeding, about over-the-counter and prescription drugs like proton pump inhibitors and oral contraceptives, antibiotics and NSAIDs, and about foods and their choices, gluten, GMOs, and sugar. And I think that in this way, this is a precautionary message that is such powerful prevention. But functional medicine also offers healing. And it does that sometimes in such a specific and tailored way to an individual that I think it can feel like fairy lights illuminating the path home for some patients. So functional medicine brings concepts like biochemical individuality, toxin mitigation, organ reserve, and informed choice to a conversation that thus far only has two words in it, sick and drugs. And I think that, in my opinion, allopathic medicine's swan song has been sung. I'm pretty sure that you've heard it, and I'd like to change the game together. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Appreciate it.